Hello everyone, I hope everything is going well with you. So in this tutorial we are going to learn about the different layout methods with int Kinter and also throughout this tutorial we are going to build a simple calculator in order to show you the differences between the different layout methods. So let's get started. Alright everyone, so I decided to write here some comments that will explain the differences between the different layout methods. So if you remember, by the last episode we covered the pack method, which allows you to throw your widget into the nearest position in the given direction. So the default was side equals top, and then you could see your button for example located at the very top position. But when it comes to grid or place, which those are are the two different layout methods that we did not cover yet, the behavior is quite different. So let me show you the differences between pack and grid. And in order to show you that, I will allow myself to create here some buttons. So for a beginner we will create a button and then we will throw it inside the root. And then we will write some random text here. And then we will go ahead and try to grid this out. Now, when you put the grid method, you are required to put in some information in order to decide where you want to grid your widget. And it is going to be decided by the column and row indexes. Okay, so if you imagine an Excel spreadsheet, it is just as equal to an Excel spreadsheet and then you have to decide the exact location with providing the information like column and row index. So it will be here column equals to zero and then row equals to zero. And once I run that out, you will see the behavior. So let's just make that a little bigger. And then you can see that button located itself in the very top left position. But if I will go ahead and try to create one more button, so let me just copy and paste those out. And then we will change this to button one. And then we will write here button two. But now I'm going to put here beside zero, one so the row index will be one for button two and then i will run that out and then you could see that the second button jumped out to here and this is because i decided to raise by one its row index and the same behavior would be if i go ahead and raise the column index for my next button so i will go here and copy and paste myself one final time and then i will change this to button three and then i will write here one and then i will revert this to zero and then if i run that out you could see that there is three buttons now with different column and row indexes as this stands for zero zero and this stands for zero one and that one stands one one zero so this is what you basically have to realize when you work with grid versus the pack method but one more important point that i have to specify here you cannot mix up within one widget the pack and the grid method. So actually this makes sense because those two are dynamic layout methods and if you go ahead and try to pack some button within your root widget, it is just going to mix things up and the Kinter will not know how to deal with that. So in order to avoid this, when you decide to use one of the layout methods, you have to stick with that throughout all the buttons and labels and stuff like that that you are going to create. So in order to show you my point, I will go ahead and try to create one more button. And actually it will make sense to try to copy things out here once again and change that to four. And then besides grid, we will write here pack and then we will allow ourselves to delete those arguments here. And now if I go ahead and run that out, you can see the exception down below and it says to me that I cannot use geometry manager pack which already has 
some widgets managed by grid, okay? So it is extremely important that you don't mix things up. But there is a way that you can overcome this if sometimes you want to use the grid method and sometimes you want to use the pack method. And I will show that just in a second. But before I go further, I want to talk about this third layout method, which is called place. Now, basically, place allows us to locate our widget within a given pixel a point so if I go here and change the button for method from pack to place I will need to specify some location within the pixel which is going to specify the width and the height and if I go ahead and write here x equals to 0 and then y equals to 0 it is basically going to locate that button in the very top left position so I can go ahead and run that out and in order to show you the differences let's just write here button 1 2 and 3 and then 4 here and then if I go ahead and run this you can see that the button 4 is in the very top left position because our arguments for x and y were both 0 but if I change that from x equals to 0 for something like x equals to 100 for example this will actually take that button and move it to right so let's run that one final time and then you can see that the button for location has already been changed. Now I know that it doesn't look quite nice, but I really want you to be aware of the three different layout methods that we have in Kintur. And you can see that the button one is right there. Now you can see that you can mix up between grid and place because basically the pack and the grid layout methods are kind of dynamic and the place is like a layout method where you hard code the location where you want to put that widget so it is a legal action to mix up between pack and place and then grid and place okay so let's move further within our project and then we will try to implement those layout methods within a calculator project okay so this documentation is quite useful when you want to play around with the grid method and you can see that there are a lot of arguments that you can specify if you want to reorganize or recustomize the gridding system within the Tkinter project that you create and there is explanation for each of the arguments that you can use so definitely check that out and I will put the link for that in my description. Alright everyone so now I want to talk about the frame widget. So basically the frame widget allows us to contain more widgets so we can go ahead and try to create frames within our main window and then we can locate some buttons text and stuff like that within our frames and then this will allow us to organize some advanced graphical user interfaces and then we will have more control about each of the widgets that we go ahead and create them so let me show you an example of how frame works because the frames could be sometimes tricky to understand now let's try to go ahead and try to create frame one and then this will be equal to frame now I want this to be inside my root and basically this will be the only argument that I will specify and then I will go ahead and try to pack my frame and as an argument here I will provide the side equals left okay and now if I go ahead and run this actually before that let me make this window a little bit bigger so it will be root.geometry and then I will write something like this you should be aware of that if you watch the latest tutorial so if you don't know what geometry method does definitely consider watching my first video about Kinder. so if we go ahead and run that out you can see that although we have packed our method we should expect from some differences within our window but we don't see that and the reason is when you go ahead and create a frame the frame is going to be transparent if you don't put inside your frame 
some widgets okay so in order to prove that we can go ahead and try to provide here background color and we will make that to be equal to red okay so the way we can achieve this we can go ahead and write here ff and then four times zero basically this is the known way to provide red color with hexadecimal values so if i go ahead and run that out we should expect for a kind of new widget with red background but we don't see that and that happens because there are currently no widgets inside our frame one so what i will do now i will go ahead and create a new button and then i will put that inside our frame one so it will be button and then as the first argument we are not going to specify root as usual we are going to write here frame one so this button will understand where to locate itself so here we will write text equals to button one more time and then we will go ahead and button one dot pack and that will be enough now let's go ahead and run that out and then you can see that we have button in the very left position although we did not provide anything inside our pack but we still do have the problem with the background color so the reason we don't see that background color it is basically because the frame size is going to be decided by the contained widget size so if we go ahead and created one single button inside our frame what that means it means that the frame's size is just as equal to button size and then it actually controls the entire area of that frame and if you noticed we did not specify any background color for that button so in order to overcome this we can go ahead and specify some special arguments to our frame that will allow us to expand it and here we need to provide some more arguments and it will be expand equals to yes and then this will expand our frame and then we also want to decide where to expand that frame so in order to decide where we are going to expand we need to specify fill equals to something now this fill parameter is going to decide if we want to expand our frame from side to side or vertically okay so if we go ahead and write here x this is basically going to expand it from side to side and you can see that over here so you can see that the red area is our frame and then we have one single button over there and if i go here and change that to y this is basically going to expand it vertically okay so it is also one more important behavior that we have to understand and if i go ahead and write here both so the boat is going to expand it for x and y together and that is why i expect to see that red area on my entire window and if i go ahead and run that out you can see that this is exactly what happens if you specify the fill equals boat okay everyone so we are ready to start building some nice calculator and i draw a basic sketch about the calculator that we are going to build so let's just raise the powerpoint up and then we assume that this is our window and i want our window to split it into two and we can do that with frames so we will go ahead and create two frames so basically the yellow area will be like the frame and then we want to create two of those and we want those two frames to be like this so one be in the left side and then the other one will be on the right side okay so let's put this in the python code and i will go back to our pycharm and let's start writing this okay so we will create two frames and in the left pain we will have the different numbers and the actions that we can take with the calculator like multiplying addition and stuff like that and on the right area we will have the calculation and the results itself okay so we will go back to our pie charm and we will create two frames so the first one will be numbers frame and this is the frame that is going to be with all the numbers so each but each number will be a button that we can press it and then this will write the calculation for us and those buttons are going to be inside the numbers frame 
So that is going to be equal to a frame and we want that inside our root. And I want to provide here the background color as well. So it will be BG equals to the hexadecimal value of black. And this will be all zero. So you want to make sure that you write here six times zero because this is the value for black in hexadecimal values. And then we will go ahead and tag our frame. Now here we want to specify some more information and we will write here side equals left. And also we want to expand our frame. So it will be expand equals yes. And then we will write here fill equals both. So this frame will be expanded to our entire window. And if we run that out, you can see that we have a window that has been changed to all black. And this is because our frame has been expanded for both sides okay so now i will allow myself to copy the code here and then i will paste that in and then i will change that to result frame and then the only thing that i'm going to change here would be the side equals right and this way i will have two frames that are going to be expanded for both sides and basically if we do that we will have two frames that are going to be in the same size and this way i will have the window splitted into two panes so in order to prove my point i will write here something like this so i don't know which color this is going to output for us so let's run this out and then you can see the differences between the frames so this is our left frame and this is our right frame okay so let me revert this back into the original black color and continue from here okay so now we want to create a label and basically the labels in tkinter allows us to display some text so i opened a calculator here and basically you can pay attention that if i press some buttons that there is a label that its text has been changing for every time that I press the button, okay? So it is important to reach this kind of behavior. And I'm going to provide here one more variable that is called result screen and that will be equal to a label. So this label is going to contain some text that we are going to change it in the future as long as we keep pressing some buttons, okay? So we want to put this label inside our results frame. So I will write here result frame. And we currently don't want to provide anything inside our text value, but we want to give that a little bit styling. And in order to create some nice styling, I will go ahead and create one more file and I will call that style. Okay, and here we will provide some information about the styling for the different widgets. Okay, so we will write here result screen style. And then we will make that to be equal to a dictionary. And here we will provide some key values that we are going to import it and use it inside our label. So I have written some styles for the different widgets that we are going to create just to save time. So we are going to copy and paste some styling and basically you can find the code for what I'm pasting here on my website and also I will put that inside the description. So you can see that we have the width size which is eight and we have the font which is going to accept a tuple and you should be familiar with those arguments if you watched the last video. And I also have background color equal to black and we have the foreground color equals to white. Okay, so we will go back to our main file and we will import those styles. So from style import everything. And then we will go down here and we want to go ahead and use this dictionary as the information of the results screen. So we have to go with double asterisk sign and write here result screen style. Okay, so if I go ahead and write here result screen dot pack, I should see that widget inside our 
frame. So sorry for the mistake here. Let's change that to underscore. And you can see that we quite don't see anything because our text is empty. So in order to verify that, let's write here something like CALC. So this will be a shortened version for calculator. And then you can see that our text is right there. So everything is fine and we can continue. Okay, so now we want to continue from here to creating buttons. And those buttons are going to be the numbers buttons. Okay, so in a basic calculator, let's open it. You can see that we have nine buttons for one to nine. And we also have the zero and the different operations buttons okay so we will start by creating the buttons from one to nine here and in order to do that we can create a list of all the integers between one to ten and we can use for that the range built-in function so we can write something like numbers equals to range and we will provide here some information and our starter integer will be one and our stop integer will be ten and we will step by one so this actually actually generates all the numbers from 1 to 10 but it does not include the last number so it is actually going to generate from 1 to 9 okay so this is quite what we want and we also want to convert that into list just because it is more comfortable to see that as a list now we can go ahead and iterate through all the numbers and we can write here for num in numbers so let me change this location here so we will have a better look and we will write here for num in numbers. And between that, we can create some buttons. And basically, those buttons are going to be created in our window. Okay, so we will go here with a variable name like button underscore num. And we will make that to be equal to button. And basically, this button is going to be inside our numbers frame. And we will write here text equals to num. And this is because we want each of the buttons to display its number. And we will provide also a styling for each of the buttons. So what that means, it means that we will go back to our style file and we will create here some more styling. So we will write here button style and we will make that to be equal to an empty dictionary. And here we will provide some information as well. And for that, I also have a ready code snippet. So we will go and paste that in. And this code snippet you can also find from my description or from my website. So here I actually decrease the font size from 48 to 24. And I decrease the size of the width from 8 to 4. Okay, so we will go to our main. And here we will take the same action so it will be double asterisk sign and we will write here button style now if i go ahead and basically grid this out and i provide an information like row equals num and then column equals to zero this is not going to be quite nice and the reason is all the buttons are going to be one under each other and we want to avoid that so the behavior that we want to reach here is like a table with three columns and three rows. And this could be a tricky action to take, but you have to think about an algorithm to do that. And basically I already have done that and I will show it to you, but there are a lot of ways to accomplish that kind of task. So if you don't like my solution, you can basically go ahead and try to write different code than what I'm going to do now, okay? So I will allow myself to delete this line and I will go before that button num creation and write some if statements. So those if statements are going to be several mathematical operations that will allow us to achieve the looking of table with three columns and rows. And basically, if you don't understand the algorithm behind what I'm writing here, that is totally fine because there are a lot of ways to achieve this. If you want, that is not something that I prefer to do, but if you want, you can go ahead and create nine buttons manually, but I do prefer to do that with for loops, so it is kind of a shorter way rather than copying and pasting lines. So I will write here if num, remainder three is not equal to zero. So basically I'm checking if the iterated number 
when I divide it by 3 has a remainder or not, okay? So in this case, I'm writing not equal to 0 and this is basically going to check if the iterated number has a remainder, okay? So I will create the indentation for that line and I will go here and grid my button and I will write here column equals to num remainder of 3, okay? And also I will go here and write row equals to and here i want to use an imported library which is called mat okay so i will go above here and write import mat and i will go back here and use the method of seal okay so what seal is going to do it is going to search for the nearest integer but it is going to round that upper okay so if i have a number which is like 1.3 then it is going to round it to the next integer which is 2 okay so i will provide here the result of num divided by 3 okay and i will go within our else statement and besides copying this line here i will allow myself to locate it here so in any case i will have the button creation but i will customize the gridding regarding the results of the if statements that i'm doing here so within our else block i will do button num dot grid and then here i will write column equals to 3 and as the row i will just copy and paste the same statement so it will be mat.seal and as the information i will put num divided by 3 okay so this should show me the buttons like in table with three columns and rows so let's check that out Okay, so you can see that we have the expected behavior. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, 8, 9. Okay, so this is what we wanted to achieve. So if you want, you can take a moment to understand what I just did here. But basically, I don't want to focus on the algorithm too much on that video because that's a way not related topic. And if you want to ask questions about what I just wrote here, basically, you can comment it down and for sure I will respond. Okay, so I will continue by creating one more button, which is going to accept the value of zero. Okay, so it is important to deal with the zero as well. And here I will create button num underscore zero. Okay, and I will make that to be equal to button. And here I will write numbers frame. And also I will go with text equals to zero. Make sure to not write it as string. That is important. And as the style, I will write button style with double asterisk sign. And here I will go with button underscore num underscore zero dot grid. And here as the information, I want that button to be located at the first column. So this is why I'm going to write column equals one. Because if you remember, the very first index that we started when we created some buttons was the number of one and not zero because this generates all the numbers between 1 to 9. So let me write that out here so it will be easy to remember. And we want to display this button inside a new row. So it will be row equals 4. And now if I go ahead and run this, you can see that the 0, excuse me, you can see that the 0 is located at the first column but at the fourth row, okay? So it makes sense that the zero should be here. And now I'm going to provide some more information that is going to be more related about the different operations that you can do within your calculator, okay? So we have to create some more buttons here. And basically, I prefer this time to not going with for loops, so it will be much easier to create buttons for all kind of operations. So I will go here with button plus as a beginner and i will write here button and i want that inside my numbers frame as well and i want that to be equal to plus so it will be a plus sign within a single quote string and i want to keep the same styling again so it will be double asterisk sign and then button style and then i want to grid that out and now as the information it makes sense to give column equals two 
but I will keep the same row, okay? So it will be something like this. And now if I go ahead and run that out, you can see that the plus is right there. But if we go to an original calculator, it is maybe a better option to write the operations in a separated column, okay? So maybe I will change that out to something like column equals four and row equals to one. So it will be right there. And then the minus and the divide and the multiplying be in that column. So let me copy and paste some of the codes over here and we will write here three times. So one more time, okay. Now I will change the rows for two, three, and four. And I will change the text from plus to minus and then the multiplying sign and then the dividing sign. And I also want to make sure that I change my variable name. So it will be subtract here. Let me just copy and paste the variable names. Excuse me for that. So button underscore subtract. And here I want to call it button multiply and paste that out and I will call that button divide. Okay, so we can create for loop for that as well, but I don't want to do that because there are two ways to create multiple buttons and basically this is fine by copying and pasting it. So we have the operations over there and we also want to provide the equal sign and also the clean sign. So I will have the ability to clean everything that is going to be inside our calculation. So it is going to be quite same for something like this. So let me write here some operation. And if we press the equal sign, basically you can see the result. But if I press over that button, basically it is going to clean everything, okay? So it makes sense to create two final buttons and we will call them button equal. And we will make that to be equal to a button as well. Actually, we can copy everything from here to save our time. And we will change that to equal sign and we will grid that button and we will provide the information of column equals to two, if I'm not mistaken, and the row will be four. Okay, so if I run that out, it is perfect. Then I will do the same for the clean and we will go and write here three and we will write the letter of C, basically it stands for clean and we will change that to button clean and we will write here clean as well. So if we run that out, then we have the perfect calculator and now we are ready to write the logic behind the scenes, okay? So until now, we were able to write the graphical user interface itself, but now we want to write the logic behind what each button is going to do. All right, so the entire main file is currently displaying the different widgets, but there is not even a single line of code that configures some functionality behind each button. And we are going to do that right before the root.main loop, okay? So it makes sense to go up here and write a comment that is going to look like user interface widget creations, something like this, okay? And here we will write a comment that is going to be like functionality. And here we will write all the actions that are going to be relevant for configuring the functionality behind everything. So we have to start with creating several functions over there because in order to give some button a command, which is going to configure the functionality of a button when it is clicked, we have to create functions with names, okay? So we will start creating some functions. And our first function is going to configure every button that are not clean and not equal. And the reason is, let me run that program and explain that out. So we know that we have to write some functionality over here that is going to calculate the statement that is going to be over that text. And this button is going to clean the text of that label. But all the other buttons that we have created are basically going to add some text characters to that label. So their behavior are quite same. So we want to write a function that its name is going to be update result 
screen. So if you remember, we called the result screen over there. Okay, so let me just delete everything from here. So it makes sense to display here nothing. And now we will go here and write some code that is going to configure the result screen text. So at the very first stage, we want to grab the current text of that result screen label. So we will go with result screen. And in order to receive back some value of the properties, we have a special method that is called cget. And here we can write the key for the value that we want to receive. And within our string, we will write text. Okay, so here we will assign that as a variable that is called current text. Okay, and we will make that to be equal to the result underscore screen dot get and then as an argument we write text. And then from here we grab the current text of the result screen and now we want to grab the pressed buttons text. Okay, so we will have the ability to add to that result screen label. Okay, so we will go here with updated text and we want to write here current text plus the text of the received button. So now we have to receive a parameter and we will call it clicked button. So it makes sense to call it clicked button because basically we want to receive the text of the clicked button each time in order to add to that text. Okay, so here I will go with clicked button dot get and then we want to receive the key of text. But if you remember, each of our buttons has a type of integer text. So let me show you. So you can see here that we create buttons, but we provide the text as equal to num, and this num is integer. So we want to convert that to a string. So this is why we are going to write here this. And now as we have the updated text, we are going to reconfigure our result screen. So if you remember, we can configure the properties for each of our widgets. So we can go here with result screen dot configure. And here we can write text equals to updated text. And now I want to test this out. Now, in order to test that out, basically we have to iterate through our each of the buttons and assign that functionality. But in order to test that in a minimalized way, we are basically going to test that only with button zero. So let me write here button zero dot configure and we are going to write here command. So you should be familiar with what I'm doing now if you watch the previous video. Basically, you can configure some functionality for your buttons and here I want to write lambda function. So the lambda expressions are an easier way to provide functionalities. Basically, if you want to know more about lambda expressions, you can check my channel out. Definitely, I will have an upload about lambda expressions. So I will go here and I will write colon and here I will write update result screen and I will pass the argument as button num zero. And basically what this line is going to do, it is going to configure the function functionality for the button zero only. So let's run this. And basically I'm expecting here for pressing the zero and see an updated text over here. So if I press zero, you can see that we have zero. And if I press one more time, you can see that zero is being added each time. So this is the perfect behavior that I want to achieve because this is just as equal to a regular calculator, right? If I open it, you can see that when I press 987, that text is being uploaded. So I'm kind of close to reach the behavior that I want. Now you could pay attention that I have deleted the line with button underscore num underscore zero simply because I want to apply the same configuration for all the buttons that are inside the numbers frame with a for loop. All right, so now I want to configure each of the buttons that are not clean and equal, okay? So we want to configure basically the same functionality for all the numbers and operations. And we have to figure out for a dynamic way to achieve such a task. Now, if we go here, you can see that we have two frames. And basically, 
all our numbers and operation signs are under numbers frame. So we can check for child widgets inside our numbers frame and then we can iterate for each widget and then we can assign that functionality with that way. So let me show you an example how you can see the child widgets of some widget. So let's go here and write print line and here I want to check what is inside the numbers frame. So we can go here and we can call a special method that is called winfo.children. Basically, this method will be responsible to show you all the child widgets under some widget. And now if I go ahead and run our program, you can see that we have some button objects and it makes sense that we have 16 of them. And this button object here is perfectly great because that shows us that we have 16 widgets under our numbers frame. So now we can iterate over our Wm4 children and we can basically check if the widget is not equal and clean and then we can assign that functionality which is the update result screen. So let me delete this one final time and we will write here for widget in numbers frame dot winfo children and basically now we want to write an if statement that is going to check if the iterated widget is not equal or clean. Now there might be some complex ways to check that statement but I'm not going to complex things up and I'm basically going to check if the widget's text is a number or an operator sign. Okay so we will first grab the widget's text and we are going to create a new variable which is going to be called widget underscore text and we will make that to be equal to widget.siget and we will grab the text again. Okay, so now basically what I want to do here is to check if widget text is an integer or it is an operator sign. So we can go here with if and checking the type of widget text. Okay, so we can check if the type of widget text is an int. So we will create double equal sign and check if that is equal to the int. And this is basically going to check if widget text is equal to an integer and that way I can achieve my goal. And we are also going to write here one more condition. So in order to do that, I will write here or, and now I will also check if the widget text is basically an operator sign. And we can do that by widget text in and here I will provide all the operation signs that we have created. So we will write here plus and we will also write here minus and we will also write here the multiply sign and also the divide sign. Okay, so great. And now if one of the statements are true, basically this makes sense to assign the functionality that we did previously. So we will go here widget dot configure and we will write command and I'm going to write here the same lambda expression that we did previously so it will be lambda and then we will write colon and now we will go with update result screen and as the argument we will pass the widget but before we go ahead and test this we need to provide some extra functionality to our lambda expression so basically the lambda expression is like functions that you create and if you go ahead and create functions within a for loop, basically you have to specify that lambda expression is unique per that widget. So we want to give our lambda a name. So we will go ahead and write here widget equals to widget. And basically what this expression does, it says to that lambda expression that the expression itself is unique for each of the widget that we are iterating on. Okay, so this is an important statement that we have to write when we create our lambda function name. Now if I go ahead and run that out, let's see the results. So I do expect to see that nothing happens if I press here and here and that is great. Now let's go here and press some numbers and you can see that as long as I keep pressing the buttons, everything is perfect. Okay, so now let's close this out and see the operations as well and you can see that our 
result screen is being uploaded and that is what we wanted to achieve. Now there could be some extra functionalities that you can configure by yourself. For example, you can write some code that will avoid to choosing more than one operator signs. Okay, so it does not make sense to go here and write plus and minus together. So you can configure this with extra code. Okay. And now as we have done that, we can also create some functions for the clean and the equal sign. So let me go ahead and create the functionality for clean. So def clean screen. And here we will just go inside our function and write widget. I mean, result screen dot configure. And then we will change the text to empty. Okay, so it makes sense to write something like this. And now we are going to go ahead and assign this functionality to our button clean. So button clean dot configure. And because we don't have any more parameters here, we can basically go with command equals to clean screen without calling our function. Okay, so now let's go ahead and run it. And let's click some numbers and clean it. And you can see that the screen is being cleaned. So this is great. Let's test that one final time. So before we actually calculate this, let's clean it. Okay, so everything is perfect. Now there is more functions that are left to write. And basically it is important to write a function for the calculation itself. So we will go here and write def calculation and we will go inside here and write everything that is necessary to calculate the result for some of the calculations that we want to make. So first we want to grab the text that is inside the result screen, right? So we will go with result screen dot siget and then we will provide here text. And then we will write here a variable name. So it makes sense to call it screen text. Okay. And now basically we want to write four if statements that each of the if statements are going to deal with the different operations. So we have the plus, minus, multiplying and dividing. Okay. So we can go and try to look if that screen text includes plus, minus, multiply or divide signs. So it will be if minus within a string is inside the screen text. And we are going to repeat ourselves four times in order to return the different operation for each of the operation that the user asked to do. And then if that is true, we want to split that screen text by the operation itself. So it will be screen text dot split and then when we split that by the minus sign, basically we expect for the first element to be the first number and for the last element to be the second number. So I can go here and grab the first element and make that to be equal to first num and that is going to be equal to this. And then we can go here and write second num and make that to be equal to minus one, which stands for the last element. But what that means, that means that we are going to repeat those lines four times. Okay, so I'm going to do that, but I do leave you as a challenge to search for a way to efficient yourselves in order to don't repeat those two lines. So you want to look for something that is called regular expressions. Basically what regular expression does, it searches for certain special characters inside your string and then you can split your string with regular expression for any kind of operation signs. Okay, so this could be the hint that I could give you, but basically you can go and search for regular expression and then split your text by a certain operation sign. Okay, so now we want to go ahead and turn this string into an integer because basically those are the first and second numbers and it makes sense to convert them back to integers. Okay, so we will go here and convert them to integers and now we are ready to store the result inside a variable that is called result. So it will be first num minus second num. 
okay? And then we want to repeat ourselves four times, like I said. So we will go ahead and first of all, we will create a variable that is called result and I will make that to be equal to none. And right there, I will allow myself to copy and paste those lines of code four times, okay? So let's just paste those, okay? Now I will change that to plus and I will change this to multiply sign and this one will be dividing. Great, so as we have done that, the last step would be to configure our result screen text. So it will be result screen dot configure text equals to result. Okay, so I can go outside of my function and assign this functionality to the button equal. So it will be button equal dot configure and the command will be equal to the function's name and that is calculation. Okay, so let's test the results. Okay, let's see if we have done a great job and great. So let's run that out. So let's try to do addition here so one plus one and you can see that it returns two so we can clean the screen and now we can go with four times four and now we can see that this returns 16 and we can also check that for the dividing so let's go with six divided by two and now this could return us float as expected but you can basically try to handle by yourself when you have remainder for some division or not, okay? Basically, it makes sense to return here only three because six divided by two does not return any remainder. So let's clean one final time and try to subtract two numbers. And this is good. Okay, so this is quite it, I think. And I hope you enjoyed this video. Again, about the repeating here, you can avoid this, okay? I don't want to be teaching to repeating your code or something like that. But basically, I want you to search for something special that will avoid you from repeating yourself from those two lines of code, okay? So it will be quite nice challenge to look up for. All right, everyone, so I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to crack the subscribe button and also like this video. And of course, don't forget to comment what you want to ask me and I will respond for your questions. See you next time.